Good afternoon, everyone. Let's turn to Psalm 84. Psalm 84, as we continue our series through the book of Psalms entitled God's Hymnal. We're on message number 49, message number 49 in our series. And I just want to give a quick testimony how much I've been blessed by the uh, special meetings with Brother Palmer this last week. I trust that you have been as well. I really enjoyed uh, Friday's Friday night's message. I, it was something that I believe I needed, and it was something I think will be very practical for all of us when troubles come in our lives. Now we resume our series on the Psalms. Psalm 84, it says to the chief musician upon Giddeth, a psalm for the sons of Korah. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are, are they that dwell in the house, they will still be praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who, passing through the way of the valley of Baca, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer, give ear. O God of Jacob, Selah, behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you this afternoon thanking you for what you will do this service. Lord, I pray that your word would Speak loudly to our hearts, to our inner man. Holy Spirit, teach us from this passage what we need to learn, what we need to obey. Lord, I trust you for the filling of the Holy Spirit in my life right now as I declare the truth of your word. Help me to be simple and not complicated. I pray this in Jesus' name. Many, many years ago in the city of London was the Metropolitan Tabernacle where the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, once preached. The, there was a man who wanted to come in one Sunday morning and hear Spurgeon himself. However, when he came in, the building was full. It was packed. There was no place to find a seat to hear Spurgeon. Well, evidently, there was a nearby usher who saw this man look dismayed, and he said, Sir, can I help you? He said, Sir, I can't find a seat to hear Spurgeon. And the usher said to him, I'll give you my seat on one condition. When the service is over, you come back to me and tell me what you think of my preacher, Spurgeon. This usher loved to hear his pastor every morning, every Sunday morning, preach the Word of God. The man agreed and heard the preacher preach a solid Bible message. The man just walked straight past him after the service was over. He didn't even talk to the usher. 
But the usher caught him and said, Sir, I thought you were going to tell me what you thought of my preacher Spurgeon. And the visitor said, I never saw him. I only saw Jesus. What a testimony that a visitor gives to a preacher who was filled with the Holy Spirit, who allowed God to use him on Sunday mornings. And that's why many people came to hear the Prince of Preachers himself in London. Now, my focus is not on Spurgeon. My focus is on the usher. The usher was in love with his preacher. Why? Why do you think so? Yes, Spurgeon was a great speaker. He truly was. But I believe he came with a heart every Sunday, an open heart. He had the expectation of hearing from God on Sunday mornings. I believe that is why he enjoyed coming to church. And I'm suspecting that he was even glad to be an usher at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. To be an usher in God's house is a great privilege. To be a servant in the Lord's house is a privilege. Not just the preacher. Or in the Old Testament times, it wasn't just the priests. It was even the doorkeeper. This is the testimony of the doorkeeper or the usher. He says in verse 10, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. This comes from a heart of a man who served maybe at the front entrance, so to speak, and allowed people to come in to hear or to worship the Lord. He was just glad to be there. It's because we find in verse number 2, My flesh crieth out for the living God. He enjoyed God's presence. And I want you to learn from this passage that enjoying God's presence demands, I'm sorry, includes enjoying where He, that's God, promises to be. Enjoying God's presence includes enjoying where he promises to be. I entitle the message, The Usher's Song. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. Let's talk about the usher's longing. The usher's longing. You see in verse 1, it says, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. The word amiable means lovely. It was a lovely place to him. Now, we do not know for sure when this psalm was written, but I think a possibility for this psalm was in the days of Solomon. You see, Solomon built a beautiful, magnificent temple. This was a masterpiece of a building. You find in 1 Kings chapters 3 through 8, and 2 Chronicles chapters 2 through 5, it gives explicit detail of how each part of the temple was crafted. It explains the different materials that were used, like gold, brass, hewed stone, cedar trees from Lebanon, fir trees, and fabrics, different textiles, such as blue, purple, and linen. These fabrics were for the veil that separated the holy place and the holy of holies. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, it gives the special moment in Israel's history when the Shekinah glory of God entered into this beautiful temple. It says in chapter 7, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices. 
and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. What a moment that was when God Himself would dwell with His people. He did it in the days of Moses, and He was about to do it again with the temple. Now, for this usher, the psalmist here, being in the Lord's house affected his entire being. Look at verse 2. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. You see, his emotional being was refreshed whenever he came to God's house. Emotionally, he panted for the place where God dwelt. And I would even suspect that his physical well-being was reinvigorated when he came. That's why he says, My flesh crieth out for the living God. It was a blessing to him when he came to God's house. Now, it was not the building itself that made him be in awe. It was the God who dwelt in the temple. Because it says in verse 2, he didn't say, my heart and my flesh crieth out for the house of God. It was for the living God. And in the Old Testament, it was a wonder when God displayed his glory. And in this moment in Israel's history, in Solomon's reign when the temple was there, when the Shekinah glory went in, everyone bowed their heads to the ground and they could not look. It was breathtaking. It was breathtaking. And Solomon himself was amazed that God would find it fitting that he would enter in. We find in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. How much less this house that I have built. And I would also suspect that our psalmist knew for a fact that he would meet God there. He would meet God there. That's why he longed to be there. Let me ask you this question. If Jesus told you that He would show up on Sunday morning or on Sunday evening service or at the Wednesday night or Thursday night prayer meeting, would you be there? Would you show up? Would you long to be with Him, with your fellow believers? Evan Roberts was a young man from the country of Wales. In the year of 1878, he was born there. He became a young adult. He grew. He loved the Lord. He went to college. He wanted to study for the ministry. When he went to church as a young man at the age of 26, there was a deacon by the name of William Davies. He warned him not to miss the prayer meetings lest the Holy Spirit moved among the congregation and he missed it. Evan Roberts took that to heart and went to every prayer meeting that he could. He did not want to miss God moving among his people. Why do I say that? Why do I mention this man, Evan Roberts? Well, Evan Roberts, in 1904, went to a preaching convention... Seth Joshua was the evangelist who was preaching at this convention. 
And Mr. Joshua, at the end of one of his services, prayed, Bend us, O Lord. Evan Roberts was already deeply moved by the preaching, and the Holy Spirit whispered to him, to his young heart, Evan, this is what you need. You need to be bent. Following that meeting, that 7 o'clock meeting, was the 9 p.m. after meetings. That's what they had back in those days. After the main service, there was also a prayer meeting that led afterwards. And at this after meeting, there was a prayer meeting. Evan was bursting to pray. He wanted to pray. He was led of the Spirit to do so. And he gives testimony. He gives testimony to what happened in this prayer meeting. He said, quote, I fell on my knees with my arms over the seat in front of me, and the tears flowed freely. I cried, bend me, bend me, bend me, bend us, Lord. And he said, what bent me was God's commending his love and not my seeing anything in it to commend. This was the beginning of the Welsh Revival of 1904-1905. People have recorded and estimated that almost over 100,000 people were converted to Christ that year in the small country of Wales. And if you study revival history, this Welsh Revival impacted other nations. God began to sweep across the globe to other nations where Christians were seeking for revival. It started here when this young 26-year-old man cried out, Bend me. But he would not have prayed, Bend me, O Lord, if he missed the prayer meeting. If he missed being in God's house. If he missed meeting God where God was. I ask again, if Jesus told you that He would show up on Sunday morning, or Sunday evening, or Wednesday night prayer meeting, would you be there? Would you show up? 1 Corinthians chapters 3, 16 and 17, it says this, the Apostle Paul says, Know ye not that ye, the word ye is the plural of the second person, you, you all, Know you not that you all are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, in you all? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, you guys are the temple of God. It's not the building. It's the church, the body of Christ. And God longs to dwell with His people. He wants to meet with us on Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Sunday afternoon, or Wednesday night prayer meetings. He wants to meet us there. Why? We are His temple. He wants to dwell with us. The psalmist did not love God's house because of its architectural beauty. It was because he wanted God himself. 1 Chronicles 16, verse 11. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face continually. Christians, I venture to say that the psalmist did not take lightly the importance of being in God's house. What is your attitude to God's house in 2021? I completely understand that we are in the middle of a pandemic. I understand that. I don't want to be insensitive to that. But I do want to remind you that Jesus is coming soon. We do not know when. We do not know when. But we find in Hebrews 10.25, 
we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Unfortunately, there are some Christians who don't take it seriously. But we are to exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Jesus is coming. Therefore, we need to make it a priority to be in God's house. Because we need to hear the word of God, we need to be challenged, we need to be changed, and we need to be exhorted by other believers. We need to be encouraged. Do not let the deceitfulness of sin keep you from church. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. There may be a Christian here. The reason why you have not showed up on Sunday mornings is because you could be in a specific sinful uh, situation. You have allowed sin to creep in. And you are letting sin deceive you. And it's hardening your heart. My friend, there is nothing more encouraging than being around God's people who want to encourage you to walk with God. And I find it powerful when Christians, when they see a brother or sister who's, who left the, the path, so to speak, they're no longer walking with God, but they see they need to get back to walking with God, and the whole church gets involved and helps and encourages his brother in any way possible. Don't forsake the assembly. I want to focus on one more point. Let's skip down to verse 9. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of of wickedness. What an admission. This usher enjoyed being the man at the entrance who would allow people to come in and hear and worship the Lord. It made him glad to see people walk in the door because he wanted them to know his God. He wanted people to know his God. Now, a couple points I want to show you from this sentence here. Number one, it was a joy that he was serving at all in the temple. It was a blessing. It was a joy. A day in thy courts is better than a thousand days outside the temple. Just to spend a day in God's house was a joy. He found it humbling that God would want him to be the guy out there, to be the doorkeeper. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus who hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. In Ephesians 3, I believe it's in verse 8, he calls himself the less than least of all the apostles. You see, the Apostle Paul knew where he came from. He was one of the brightest of the Pharisees in the days of the early church. He persecuted the early church. Because he thought he was doing God's service because these Christians were proclaiming a risen Christ. And he thought it to be blasphemy until he was on his way to Damascus and he met Jesus himself. And God transformed his life and with that he was sent to be an apostle to the Gentile world and he found it humbling 
that God would see him fit to be a servant of the Lord. It was a joy to him. My question to you, are you serving in your local church? But pastor, Brother Daniel, you don't understand. I don't have a lot of talent. God's not looking for talent. He's looking for a willing heart. This psalmist, he was glad to be the doorkeeper. He was glad to be the doorkeeper. In 2021, let's put it in our context. He was glad to be the usher. He was glad to be the one collecting the offering. He was glad to be the one who would clean up after the service. He was the one who was glad to serve food uh, at the luncheon hour after the morning service. He was glad to be the servant. Which leads me to another point. That you and I should be content where God places us in God's house. Every servant, every part of the church of the living God is important. Read 1 Corinthians 12. Paul gives the illustration of the body, the human body. And the parts of the body do not say to each other, I don't need you. The eye doesn't tell the nose, I have no need of you. The ear doesn't tell the eye, I don't need you. Or... The eye doesn't tell the arm, I don't want you, you don't, you're not needed. No. The, every single part of the body, every single part of the anatomy works together to make a whole body, a one, one unit that works, serving and helping each other. So many... Christians and churches today bicker over positions, over uh, who has the responsibility of doing this or doing that, who has the responsibility of counting the, the offering, who gets to pray, who gets to read scripture, who does this and who does that. But can I be honest with you, fellow Christians, you and I should never have that attitude when we're in God's house. Why? Because the main point of being in God's house is Him. To worship Him and Him alone. Then he concludes, The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk brightly. You want to be blessed, Christian, in God's house? Walk upright. How is your walk? Are you letting little sins slip? Are you letting your conscience slip? Maybe by the things that you watched, by the things that you listened to, the things that you that you said to people. Maybe there were some choice words that you said that were not appropriate. They weren't encouraging. How will you make it right? How will you find forgiveness? First of all, go to the blood. And then get right with that brother or sister whom you have offended. And make it right. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusted in thee. I know we didn't go through the whole psalm, but I find that this usher in this psalm was glad to be in God's house. It was a blessing to him. It was a joy. A real joy. How about you? Do you find it a joy to be in God's house? The usher at the Metropolitan Tabernacle did it. And he didn't care that he was just an usher. He was just glad to be a servant in God's house. Because he loved his God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
give us this attitude that the psalmist had here. When he was worshipping in the tabernacle, it didn't matter that he was just a doorkeeper or an usher. It didn't matter to him. He was just glad to be where you are because he longed for you. He wanted you to satisfy his longing soul. Lord, I pray that if there's any reservation in our hearts, whatever keeps us from truly longing for you, would you take it away? Would you replace it with a love and a devotion to you? Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be walking in the light and enjoying being in your house. Lord, give us the attitude that says, Lord, we want to be in your house every Sunday because we want to meet you. Do that special work in our hearts this afternoon. We pray in Jesus' name.